How many times have we watched as key officials from high-profile sports have fronted journalists and said things like this? We find there is significant room uh, for uh, improvement and building a culture and environment in which people can thrive. The failings of our systems has resulted in unacceptable outcomes for some of our players, coaches and management. It should never have got to this point and Hockey New Zealand unequivocally apologises to all those who have had a poor experience. The nature of the allegations that have been received by New Zealand Football earlier this week uh, have been discussed by New Zealand Football uh, Executive Committee. Obviously we've received those uh, letters outlining a number of concerns and we take those very, very seriously. A key theme that came through, however, was the lack of transparency and this was particularly around selection, recruitment, carding and competitions. Then in August 2021, the fact that high performance sport needed a serious shake-up was starkly brought to the fore with the death of cyclist Olivia Podmore. Liv's mum Ninka and her husband Chris Middleton were this morning briefed on the findings of the inquiry that was triggered following the 24-year-old's death last August. Do you think things will get better? I would just like to think they would. <laughs> to honour Livy and to so that her death is not in vain, yeah, I would like to hope that they will get better. Making life better for athletes is at the heart of a new body that kicked into life at the start of this month. The Sport Integrity Commission Te Kahu Raunui is here to help safeguard sport and recreation in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Whether it's on the field, getting active in the outdoors or behind the scenes, enjoying physical activity means participating safely and fairly. If you need help to The athletes have trust and confidence in this new body and they feel like they will be well supported by this body and I think the mandate for it is to be participant centric which is possibly what we haven't seen from other organisations. I get asked a lot, are you going to get a deluge of complaints and part of me is like, oh I hope not but then I think, no I hope so because if your complaints go down, I think that's a bigger problem than, than if they go up because you know, you, you're not hearing it. Kia ora, I'm Alexia Russell and today on The Detail, the Sport Integrity Commission Te Kahu Raunui, the new independent crown entity formed after a system-wide overhaul, sparked by a series of damning reviews into the country's elite sporting environments. It will look after athletes, keep things fair in sport and recreation, and referee when things go badly wrong. The Commission has a big remit. It will develop the country's first ever integrity code kind of a rule book for sport and investigate any breaches of that code. It'll also be a complaint and dispute resolution service. It'll incorporate Drug-Free Sport New Zealand and become the country's national anti-doping organisation. This is pretty exciting in a lot of ways. New Zealand's newest government organisation at a time when government organisations are being slashed and burned. What's the difference with this one? I think this one has really been a long time coming. Dana Johansson is RNZ's sports correspondent. So it's it's probably off the back of about five or six years of um, feasibility studies and working groups and, of course, all the, the many, many sports reviews that have played out in high-performance sporting environments. Um, so it was back in mid-2022 that then sports uh, Minister for Sport and Recreation, Grant Robertson, announced that there would be this new commission that Cabinet had agreed to the establishment of an independent integrity commission in sport. The report's findings lay bare the need for meaningful change and I am determined that we will see that. In particular, the need to ensure that sports administrators and High Performance Sport New Zealand are putting the mental health and well-being of athletes at the centre of their approach. Mental health and well-being are essential to people performing at their best. I strongly believe that you can achieve both well-being and high performance. It is not an either-or situation. There is no trade-off. We can and we must have both. And so in August 2023, it was really the, the last act of the Labour government was to pass this bill and it received uh, cross-party support. And I think that's probably a reflection that even though um, these types of issues in sport around abuse um, and bullying and discrimination have been a hot-button topic, they haven't really been politicised at that level. So that's why um, it did receive that, that support from across the political divide. And I guess if it has received such wide support, 
there's an indication that this body is needed. Absolutely, and we've seen successive reviews sort of show show the need for it. So I guess the origin really dates back um, to 2018, which I call the year of reckoning for sport. We had a number of high-profile reviews play out in various sporting environments, um, including cycling, hockey, football was another one. Um, and several of, of those reviews sort of highlighted that there is insufficient capability across the sector to deal with these integrity-related issues. OK, there was no one really set up to do the job, no one... No head honcho to say, you've got to do something about your in your sport. There were very kind of disparate ways of, of dealing with it. And I think the key thing about this new body is it will be entirely independent of Sport New Zealand and High Performance Sport New Zealand, which was one of the, the key findings to come out of a lot of the reviews is that there wasn't a lot of trust in the system, there wasn't a lot of confidence in the system. And the Integrity Working Group that was established recommended that it be independent of Sport New Zealand and High Performance Sport New Zealand to ensure that responsibility for integrity is separate from funding and selection. So really cutting it off from from the decision makers right. in sport. So there's no possibility of any corruption of, of the same sort of things that have been going on in these sports transfer into the new body. Absolutely. Because what we were seeing with a lot of these reviews as well is that high performance sport New Zealand were commissioning these reviews that in, in a sense were also investigating high performance sports own role in, in allowing some of those toxic situations to fester in a lot of those sports and of course while these reviews were independent you can argue that there is a perception that they're not independent and that they're the ones commissioning the re- reviews and deciding firstly whether they're necessary and secondly deciding um, the terms of reference and setting the parameters for that investigation if, if one is, is commissioned. So what is in the attempt Integrity Commission's sandbox, what is it in charge of? They've got a very broad remit. So um, obviously they are looking at those types of issues that we talk about playing out in high-performance environments, but they go right down to the community level and what's happening there around sideline behaviour, child protection issues, and I guess some of the grunty issues around um, anti-competition manipulation, anti-corruption, and then we have the remit of the Drug Free Sport New Zealand folded into this new agency as well. So does that mean that it would go, you know, look at issues like, say, Auckland's top level rugby landscape, which has been in for a lot of criticism lately, or um, complaints of assault on a sideline at a kid's soccer game? Would it cover those kind of things? It, it could, but it's important to note that it does not replace the kind of established disciplinary procedures that exist within those those ind- individual sports. So, so like, would you bump it up if you couldn't get a response from those Exactly. Yeah. So I guess for for example, if if a young player punched a referee at a football game at the weekend, then that would be dealt with by the regional football association. But perhaps if that player happened to be the son of the regional manager and they were given a one week ban or a very light sentence, that might be a situation where someone saw that and referred it to the Sport Integrity Commission and said, hey, this isn't right, we think this needs looking at. So how would the Integrity Commission act if there were complaints about inappropriate behaviour? There is an established Sport and Recreation Complaints and Mediation Service. It's got a terrible name. So that was kind of a bolt-on fix that um, Sport New Zealand introduced while this kind of working group was was trying to get a new a new structure in place. So that is also folded into the new agency. So I guess uh, the commission will act as a triage, and if it's something that can be re- resolved through mediation or, or this sort of um, service, I'd refer it to that service. If it's something that they feel needs further investigation, they can commission an investigation itself and even convene a disciplinary panel to um, impose sanctions. So it has quite a lot of power. It does, yes. There is a, it comes alongside a Sport and Recreation Act that um, outlines all its powers. I guess the key compliance lever for the agency will be a new National Code of Integrity, which hasn't been properly drafted yet or it's in the final stages of drafting and and will be put out for feedback among the sports and the adoption of that code is voluntary but it is in sports best interest to adopt it because it really helps them sort of set out minimum standards and they're very they they stress minimum standards not minimal standards um, in terms of 
I guess, putting these structures in place for a lot of these sports, particularly the smaller sports that may not, that essentially run on a volunteer basis, right. that may not have the capability or the, the the knowledge or the toolbox to in, implement some of these things, it will sort of give them a structure and a blueprint mm. to work from. So people who don't have that institutional experience of running a club, then an association, for example. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But... It also has the power if sports choose not to adopt the code and some of the bigger sports like rugby or cricket might say actually we've got really good integrity functions already, we don't see the need for this. However, if there are situations that occur um, where... Uh, the Commission believes there has been clear integrity breaches that have not been dealt with well by the sport. They have the power under Section 32 of the Act to initiate their own investigation and they have powers to compel these organisations to provide the paperwork, the documentation and if they don't they can go to a district court to get a compliance order for it so that they are well established powers but these would only be used in, in very, very um, remote situations or very significant, where significant abuses have occurred. So this body really has been given the tools to to not be just a wet bus ticket situation, you know. I mean, in the folding in of the Drug Foundation too, it looks like their overarching purpose is basically to keep sport good and clean. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I guess it also it streamlines the integrity functions, whereas, you know, Previously, they were quite sort of spread out and, and no one quite knew the appropriate channel to go through. It, is, it provides a one-stop shop to kind of triage issues and, and get on top of things. So, yeah, I, I think it, it has significant powers, but as I said, it would take an extraordinary situation to invoke some of those powers. Corruption is one of its purviews as well. Is there much corruption in sport in New Zealand? Anti-corruption, <laughs> but not promoting corruption, but anti-corruption. <laughs> um, so I, I guess we, we kind of naively think that New Zealand is immune to some of these corruption issues, particularly around competition manipulation. Um, but probably recently, the recent example with the investigation into some of the A-League players and match fixing and there have been criminal charges laid in that case. It suggests it is hitting closer to home than than we realise. On the eve of the biggest Phoenix football game in history, a scandal has erupted in Australia involving at least two of their former players accused of deliberately conceding yellow cards. All white, Clayton Lewis and former Phoenix captain Ulysses Davila are among those arrested in dawn raids for their alleged involvement in a betting fix. It's important to note that this new agency will not replace the functions of, of the police and the serious fraud office. They will still in- investigate serious cases where, where there's been criminal behaviour. But um, probably where the commission comes into play is around those antecedent behaviours that precede criminal behaviour. So when we talk about match fixing in some sports, it's their own codes will say that that sports betting in itself is illegal in the game. We saw back in 2017 a White Ferns cricket player, Hayley Jensen, was banned from the game for six months for um, just laying a $2 bet on, on a Black Caps Australia game. So not even a game she was involved with, but that was in contravention of Cricket Australia's corruption policy at the time, and, and she received a severe a penalty for that. So it's those types of behaviours that the Commission will perhaps manage. They see a key part of their role as, as being around education and that, and that really plays into what Drug Free Sport New Zealand has tried to do over the last sort of five years under Nick Patterson is push the, the education piece alongside the compliance piece so that they don't want to be issuing sanctions to people. They want to stop it before that happens. Most people in the sport and recreation sector, pretty much everyone, they're there for the right reasons. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of sport and recreation interactions that are positive every day. Uh, so really just trying to make sure that, that that number stays high and that if something does go wrong, people get the help they need. Let's meet the Sport Integrity Commission's new CEO, Rebecca Rolls. My background professionally has been very much investigation focused. So I've been I've worked in the justice sector pretty much all my life through police um, corrections, serious fraud office for big big amounts of time. So worked on that whole prevention right through to anti corruption, sort of the pointy end of, of the things that affect sport and recreation and integrity, I guess. Uh, and then myself have a sporting background, so I played cricket and football and then Football in, for I think you're missing out the big thing here. 
football <laughs> yeah. for New Zealand. For, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Both of them. Yeah, yeah. So, so obviously have had had experience in two quite different high performance um, environments. So cricket, self funded or funded by TV rights, and and the football obviously funded through high performance sport. And and you know you don't get to there without having a community uh, experience as well. So, yeah, I'm pretty lucky in terms of what I've managed to get from sport and recreation. Um, and then in twenty. 21, I moved, sort of did a bit of a, a career diagonal shift, if you like, into Sport New Zealand and uh, led the diversity and inclusion space. Um, and partly because, it, it, you know, it's, it's obviously an emerging area, but because of its effect on sport and integrity, and I've been involved in the integrity working group that put this together. So it was very much, I guess, a bit of a, a collision of passions for me and, and quite odd given through most of my life, my sport and career have been really, really separate. Um, but now I just think the evolution of this space um, and, and the way Aotearoa New Zealand is tracking uh, yeah, sort of all, all came together. What what were the factors that led up to the establishment of the um, Sport and Recreation Integrity Commission? Is there a short form for that? Because it's Sport Integrity Commission, Te Kahu Raunui is the doesn't the name. have a cute acronym though. Well, no, because there wasn't really a cute one available, <laughs> so we don't say it. Um, but no, <laughs> it's um it's one of those things that has been probably um, boiling up for a while now. We've had. You know, like many countries, probably the last ten years have had issues just just starting to creep in. So there's been some, you know, some exploratory stuff around the sports tribunal and about what what the best, I guess, uh, structure is for New Zealand and integrity and sport and recreation. And then as well as that, there have been along the way a few sort of sports specific reviews that have involved allegations of harm. Um, and and each time they've happened, you know, it's, it's Come back to some of the same things. So, so you're talking about cycling, football, cycling, football, hockey. hockey. Um, there's been there's been others as well. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, th- there's obviously an increasing need for something other than what what was in place. And and to date, you know, really the only thing that has been able to be kind of officially um, worked through is Sport Recreation Act, or the, you know, the, the act that governs uh, Sport New Zealand. Have had one clause in it that talks about dispute resolution. So that's the only lever, if you like, that Sport New Zealand has been able to use to help people work through you know, differences or, or allegations of harm or even just um, low-level complaints. And so, so what was that, a mediation service? Well, that's how the mediation service came in, absolutely. But that piece in the legislation, which is still there, by the way, just means that Sport New Zealand have the ability for the organisations they fund to be able to support dispute resolution. But it's not enough. And, and the other issue was that we heard from all the reviews is that Sport New Zealand and High Performance Sport are the funders. Of, of these sports and, and that creates an independence issue if the funders are also sorting out the, you know which um, isn't ideal for anyone including you know the government high performance sports so so your organisation does not come under that no it's completely does, separate does it does it sit over it or is it a parallel thing? No, it's completely separate. So it's an independent crown entity, which, as you will know, is about as far away from the middle of the government as you can get, um, but still be in the government and, and governed by a board of, of nine people. So, uh, And what that really means in practice is that the independent crown entities must um, must align to the, I guess, the issues or the government issues of the day, but don't necessarily have to follow uh, policy. So um, can advise the minister, um, but don't have the direct relationship with the minister. So Sport New Zealand still work through the policy process and, and other policy function, if you like, for the Sport Integrity Could, Commission. Is this likely to be a, a bit of a double up of tasks in some spaces or do you operate in completely different areas? No, completely different. And that's part of the reason to bring uh, the Sport Integrity Commission to life, really, is is to try and pull together all the things that are already happening into one space. and then So that's so when you say already happening, you're talking about overseers of corruption. Yep drug issues, all that kind of thing, complaints. Yeah, so at its, at its core, it's anti-doping. So the work that Drug Free Sport New Zealand has been doing really well for decades. So that, that becomes part of the commission and that brand no longer exists. Uh, the work that Sport New Zealand has been funding and uh, providing, so the Complaints Mediation Service, um, the education that Sport New Zealand had, an integrity portal where there were education and templates and that sort of thing. So that comes in. And then the third area that is under, well, unexplored at the moment in New Zealand is competition manipulation or, or match fixing. So with, there's a law in the Crimes Act, uh, 240A, if you're a law geek. <laughs> um, and that was brought in when New Zealand hosted the Cricket World Cup in 2015. So that's the only piece of legislation before ours that talks about competition manipulation. And that was really, you couldn't host a Cricket World Cup in a country where match fixing was legal. Um, right. Yeah, it would create some issues. And I guess we like to think of ourselves as a corruption-free country, but 
there's been a couple of incidents lately. One one quite naive one with is it Hayley Jensen? Yes. And another one um, involving the Phoenix, yes. ex-Phoenix players. That would suggest that we are not completely corruption-free. Yeah, like it's, I mean, obviously Transparency International puts us in the top three of the least corrupt countries. That's a perceptions index. Um, and, you know, we sort of jostle with Denmark and others at the top. But I think relatively, absolutely, New Zealand's fairly corruption-free from a all sort, you know, socio, all, all sorts of angles. From a sport perspective, um, I would say that uh, it's, it, we're very immature around competition manipulation, that is not a criticism, that's just a product of where we are at the, in the globe, so we're miles away. Um, we're vulnerable because of our time difference with competition manipulation, so all sport is streamed pretty much now. So while the rest of the world's asleep, Australia and the east coast of Australia and New Zealand are playing sports, so that was the only thing happening. So, of course, that's what people want to bet on at the time. And then, yeah, you sort of overlay that with some of the athletes who just are very... You know, there's an unconscious unconsciousness there. It's certainly not not necessarily always some um, intent involved. Uh, and you know, I guess just raising the education and capability is going to be really important. But there, there's also, I think, there's a nexus between the other things. Like there's a safeguarding issue in some doping cases, and vice versa. So if a kid's being pressured to take a supplement that hasn't been batch tested, for example, they might find themselves on the wrong side of a test result. We saw the young uh, Russian skater, 15 year old, uh, that tested positive. So you, you've got to be asking yourself, well, what, what? You know, she's not making those decisions. So what's in and around her? And equally, for from a competition manipulation perspective, you know that takes some grooming. That you know, from not not from the you know the sexual uh, sense necessarily, but it certainly takes a couple of you know what they call sort of honey traps or or you know oh here's a free pair of boots, you know. No complications, but then, then oh no, has so and so how's their injury coming along? You know, so mm. and, and you, you can kind of really find yourself in trouble pretty quickly. So transparency is is the key there. You know, sunlight's the best disinfectant, as you know. So the new body should be another leap forward when it comes to keeping athletes safe and sport fair. But some reservations have been expressed about the potential burden this new level of regulation could place on volunteers, such as club administrators and coaches, who are getting caught up in red tape. I think yeah, volunteers are always going to be busy, right, and, and wearing lots of hats. Um, we know that volunteers have already probably been a little frustrated by some of the red tape. Um, some of it is absolutely necessary. If you think about child safeguarding, for example, there, you must have some things in place. So, And, and we know that can be a barrier, so... The idea is that we are providing the right kind of uh, resource and support, um, you know, collateral that goes with it so that it is as easy as completely possible for people to be able to to understand, to sign up, to know what their obligations are. Um, And it doesn't ask more than what should probably already be happening. And would you be working with bodies like police and... 100%. 100%. You know, one of our early steps in the triage process is should this be dealt with by another body? And, and obviously you don't want to um, step over jurisdiction lines and operate ultra-vires. So uh, the, the police, Serious Fraud Office, Oranga Tamariki, Human Rights Commission are, are some of the many bodies that we can refer to. We can also take whistleblower complaints. So we'll list um, as um, one of the agencies that can receive those complaints. Um, and... The minute something looks that like it's not for us, and, and really we are operating that sub-criminal sphere, so um, if it's anything that that should be elevated to police, for example, immediately, then then we will, we've got those relationships set up. And the commission can also uh, kick off inquiries of its own volition. So if there's a, I don't know, maybe a media story or um, you know, some sort of thematic reason to have a closer look at something in particular, the commission can do that as well. And, and can actually say to a, a sport recreation organisation, no, we'll, we'll take that because it, it, there's some really good reasons and, and, and they're, they're the public interest. That's all for today. The Detail is a newsroom production supported by RNZ and New Zealand On Air. This episode was engineered by Jeremy Ansell and produced by Gwen McClure. Thanks to Dana Johansson and Rebecca Rolls. I'm Alexia Russell. Ka kite anō.